Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates and observers, thank you for this opportunity to brief the Council on the work of the UN International Commission of Human Rights Experts on Ethiopia, pursuant to Human Rights Council Resolution 51 slash 27 of 7th October 2022. I serve as the new chairman of the commission and I wish to take this opportunity also to introduce my co-commissioners, Mr. Stephen Ratna of the United States of America and Ms. Radhika Kumaraswamy of Sri Lanka. As members are aware, the commission has a twofold mandate to investigate and report on alleged violations of international human rights, humanitarian and refugee law since November 2020, and to provide advice regarding transitional justice. In carrying out our mandate, we have consistently sought to work with and reached out to engage with the government of Ethiopia, partners in the African Union, and civil society actors. Since the Commission presented its first report to the Council, in the September last year, the situation in Ethiopia has evolved significantly. On 2nd of November, the federal government and the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, TPLL, signed a cessation of hostilities agreement at, at ending more than two years of armed conflict that has affected millions of women, men, and children in the Tigray Arfar and Amara regions of northern Ethiopia. Since then, the region has witnessed a significant and so far sustained reduction in conflict. The Commission greatly welcomes the cessation of our seals agreement and subsequent agreement regarding the, to the implementation. We especially welcome the commitment to human rights, protection of civilians, unhindered humanitarian access, and accountability. The Commission looks forward to such efforts being sustained countrywide. Since the conclusion of the agreement, the federal government has embarked on a series of initiatives that offer a first step towards the locally owned transitional justice process. This includes the current consultation on its green paper, policy option for transitional justice. What is too early to assess progress, we are hopeful that this and other national processes contributes was inclusive, gender responsive, victim and survivor centered approaches to accountability, truth telling and reconciliation, reparation as well as the establishment of necessary policies for non recurrence of violence. Mr. President, Excellencies, despite these positive developments and rapidly improved security, we must not forget the gravity and scale of the violations committed in Ethiopia since November 2020. Our 2022 September report found reasonable grounds to believe that all parties to the conflict had committed war crimes and violation of abuses of human rights since, fasting, since fighting erupted in November 2020. The Commission continues to investigate these allegations in addition to alleged allegations of serious violation and abuses committed since the signing of the peace agreement. The Commission stresses that independent investigations and accountability for such acts is essential, not just to, for justice for survivors, victims and their families, but also to deter commission of future violations and abuses. Under international law, the federal government has the primary responsibility to ensure accountability for crimes committed during the conflict. In that regard, we note initiatives to investigate and prosecute alleged perpetrators of serious crimes, including through the Ministry of Justice and the Interministerial Task Force, IMTF. We urge the federal government to ensure greater transparency around these efforts and stand ready to offer advice in this regard. We remain concerned about a lack of pathways for accountability for serious violations committed by Eritrean forces. Mr. President, Excellencies, allow me to provide a brief update on the status of our work. The General Assembly approved the proposed budget for the Commission, and we are currently onboarding new staff members. Since we last briefed the Council, we have continued our consultation with a wide range of stakeholders 
to inform our investigation priorities and strategy. Regarding the geographical scope, our investigations addressed alleged violations in Tigray, Afar, Amhara, and Oromia regions. Regarding the material scope, in addition to the serious offenses discussed in our first report, notably attack on civilians, sexual and gender-based violence, and denial of humanitarian access, we are also addressing other violations such as arbitrary detention, violation of children's rights, and hate speech. As required by our mandate, we are investigating an alleged violation by all parties, including Eritrean forces operating on, uh, uh, on Ethiopian territory. To date, the Commission has held in-depth interviews with victims, survivors, and witnesses, and this approach is complemented by open source investigations and geospatial and satellite imagery analysis. We continue to place a strong emphasis on integrating a gender perspective in addition to the unique and intergenerational impact of conflict on children. However, we regret to date to note that to date and despite repeated requests, the government has the Ethiopian government has not yet allowed our investigation teams to the country. As a result, much of our work is being carried out remotely. So we strongly urge the government to reconsider its decision not to cooperate with the Commission. Similarly, we encourage member states to assist in facilitating assets for the Commission to Ethiopia as well as to countries hosting refugees. The Commission, pursuant to its mandate from this Council, continues to establish the facts and circumstances surrounding alleged violations and abuses, both in the past and ongoing, and to collect and preserve evidence accessible and usable in support of ongoing and future accountability efforts. Regarding our transitional justice mandate, we are closely reviewing the policy options document in detail, as well as the consultation process, you know, uh, in particular with respect to international and regional standards. We encourage wide-ranging and exclusive consultation to ensure the wishes of survivors, victims, and others affected communities are reflected. We reiterate our commitment to provide expert and technical advice to the government of Ethiopia, the National Dialogue Commission, and other domestic stakeholders. We continue to engage with the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission and the East Africa Regional Office of the High Commission of Human Rights to discuss areas of potential cooperation and information sharing and hope to see further progress in the near future. We have also engaged with states in the African Union and others following the situation in Ethiopia. Mr. President, Excellencies, the conclusion of the peace agreement between the government and TPLF is an important step. The need to investigate alleged violations both before and since the peace agreement raises an important as ever to increasing and creating a durable peace with full respect for human rights. An overwhelming message from our engagement with survivors, victims, and witnesses is their desire for greater awareness of the harm they have suffered and a resounding call for sustainable peace and justice. Many express a strong conviction that peace and justice are two mutually reinforcing objectives. One cannot exist without the other, a position, a position shared by the Commission and this Council. One man displaced, displaced from his village, detained for more than a year, and unable to return to his home, told us recently, I want to go back to my old village, but first I need to see peace. It needs to be safe to return home, but right now it is not. After peace, we need support, humanitarian and other assistance, so we may rebuild our lives. And then we need justice. Those who committed crimes should not be able to do it again. And finally, we need awareness. We need the world to know what happened to us. It cannot be forgotten. We shall not be forgotten. I thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank you, sir.